Well, we have a special treat today. You see two chairs up here, and uh, Debbie, come on up. Uh, Debbie is, I've asked Debbie if she come, would come up, and uh, I'm going to have her ask her some questions. You hear me all the time. You get tired of me, but uh, I'm going I'm to let you, you hear from Debbie. as We're going to talk about uh, the whole issue of marriage and the longevity of marriage, and uh, the message is, is entitled, you know, uh, those words at the altar. Come on, baby. I'll let you sit over here. Um, so we're going to be talking about, of course, out of Malachi 2. But I thought I, one thing would be good just to let Debbie interact with some of the some questions that, uh, about our marriage. And so she can talk, say anything she wants to say. Uh, uh, be careful, though, okay? Um, but anyway, I thought it would be good to get her perspective, especially the ladies who probably love to have that. So, Debbie, here's my, uh, and thank you, honey, for, for being here, okay? <laughs> uh, what would you say has contributed to the success and longevity of our marriage? Um, well, we got started off on the right foot, which is a good thing meaning we really knew that God had led us together to be married. We knew that. We didn't have to guess. We didn't have to hope. We didn't have to wish. We really knew that. And I think the reason we were able to know that and to discern that was because when we both met, we were really quite young, um, and, but we were both committed Christians not nominal Christians that go to church here and there, but we really both were committed Christians. We both had a, a real personal relationship with the Lord. We both put him first in our life. Um, we didn't put each other first. We put him first. So we really only wanted to know what God's plan was for us individually. Um, and we've often remarked to each other that, God is the one that gave us a love for each other. No question about it, because <laughs> we laugh about this. Naturally, we would not have liked each other. <laughs> Be <laughs> careful was, now. They may not know how to do. There were just so many things about both of us that <laughs> we wouldn't have liked, but God did it. Um, I refer now to our marriage as God's love story. Because honestly, that's what it was. He wrote the story, mm. and we played the parts uh, mm. and are still acting out the parts. But um, I think of that, and then I also think of uh, good communication. I think we've enjoyed having that. And then also, we've had a lot of humor and fun in our marriage. Um, we like to tease each other and play around. We play jokes on each other. You would often... <laughs> be careful. Yeah, I know, I'm trying to be. Uh, you would often see us dancing in the middle of our kitchen floor, slow dancing. Sometimes there's music and sometimes there's not. But we do that every week, I think. And, um, it, but really, probably bottom line to all these things, just being obedient to what we think God wants us to be and what we think God wants us to do. One thing, too, I'll go back with what Debbie said about putting the Lord first. And um, we dated, oh, two and a half, three years, right? Three years, I think. And, um, and there were a couple of times when we really felt like the relationship was, where we felt like we had come to a place where we were putting each other in the place where the only God should belong. And so we separated. We would, we would kind of break up. So we're going we're gonna to break up, and, and, and we, there was a time we went three months, really, mm -hmm. you know, until we got that right. And so I think God has honored that over the years and blessed us because we said God's got to be first. You know, that's the test, really, you know, when you're falling and when you're in love and all those, all that mushy stuff going on, mm -hmm. you know, it's the, the real test is, you know, is that's when you prove whether God's first. Uh, you talked about communication. What do you mean about communication? Um, well, communication is not just talking. It's really sharing deeply from down deep with each other. Mm. Um, sharing our hopes, uh, our struggles, our uh, weaknesses, our insecurities. Asking each other for advice. 
uh, really sharing from the gut with each other, things you wouldn't ever share with somebody else. Um, we just love to spend time together and talk. I mean, um, we will sometimes be out and just talk, and we, we reminisce, we love to reminisce about when we met. Uh, we, we go back and talk about the good and the bad things of our life together, what we may have chosen to have done differently. But uh, we will be amazed sometimes when we look up at the clock, and I, I'm honest with you when I'm saying this, sometimes three, four, even five hours have gone by just like that, and we're just stunned at what time it is because we've been talking. So that's something that, that we've done, and we enjoy being with each other and doing that. Now, sure, you may think, well, yeah, you, know, you don't have small kids, because you don't talk for five hours when you have small kids, right? <laughs> even after you put them in bed, you're too tired to talk. But even when we had uh, young children at home, we saw that as a priority in our marriage, and when we had no money, especially in seminary, we uh, sometimes would choose not to pay a utility bill and to pay a babysitter so we could go out by ourselves and talk. It's always been a priority in our marriage. We found that God also provided for that utility bill many times. So, okay, what, okay, what about, one of the reasons, and we're talking about longevity today, and I told you that, um, in marriage, so often we hear we're incompatible, uh, irreconcilable differences, and usually it's because people can't work through conflict. What about conflict? How, um, what did you say about our marriage and how it's handled conflict? Well, I would say we've certainly had our share of conflict. <laughs> well, we have intense fellowship. We don't have conflict, yeah, okay. by the way. So we want to cl <laughs> clarify that. So. Put a nice name on it, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, all couples do. I mean, when you put two different people together who've never lived together before from different backgrounds, etc., you're going to have conflict. And incompatibility is one of the purposes of marriage. Now, you may be thinking she misspoke. <laughs> incompatibility is one of the purposes of marriage uh, because God takes that incompatibility, the conflict, and he uses that to grow us up, to mature us, to smooth off those many rough edges that we might have, <clears throat> to whittle at our pride, to whittle at our stubbornness. So he uses that as well. Um, one practical thing I would like to say is, and Byron did this, uh, even in the, he started in the early days of our marriage, which I really appreciated. I didn't like it at the time, but I, I did appreciate it when we were conflicting. I don't know if that's a <laughs> verb or not, but anyway, or intense fellowship, Perfect. whatever. Um, he would say, <clears throat> we've got to talk. I didn't want to talk. He didn't want to talk either half the time, I'm sure. <clears throat> but what he would do, he would get two chairs, and he would place them so we're facing each other. Our knees literally touched. Our eyeballs <laughs> were almost touching. That's how close we were. We got it all out. Sometimes we came to an agreement. Sometimes we didn't, but we agreed to disagree. And I don't even know, well, if you realize what you did too, I'd say nine times out of 10, one thing he did, which now I look back on that, I think it's so good. He would rehearse to us both. We know that God led us together. Uh, we know that we love each other. Oh no, we didn't feel the love then, that's for sure. But it was good for him to state that because it was a fact. And maybe you even prayed a time or two, I don't remember. But that was good that you did that. I really appreciated that. I really uh, respect you for it. Sometimes he would even force me to give him a little kiss to seal the deal. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel like kissing him <laughs> at that time. But anyway, that, that, that's one way we have handled conflict. <laughs> you grew up in a Bible church that taught the, the Word of God, still does for, the, for that matter, in, in a great way. How has the Word of God played a role in, your, in our marriage, and with, but with you? Well, first, I'm so thankful I had that background of, of being taught well in a Bible church. 
uh, from the Greek and the Hebrew, doctrine after doctrine. So it was ingrained in me, and so grateful for that. But to answer your question, I mean, the Word of God's been our foundation and basis, not only for our marriage, but just for our whole life since that time. Um, I knew, for example, it was so in me that I knew as a young person, high school, junior high and high school, I was not to marry an unbeliever. I knew that. It's in the Word. Uh, that wives were to arrange themselves under their husbands. That's the literal meaning of the S word that you know, we, wives don't like sometimes. <laughs> that the husbands were to be the spiritual leaders in the home. So I knew that. So I knew what I wasn't looking for a husband, that's for sure. But I knew that's the way it would be. That's the way God designed it. He structured it that way. And I wanted that because I know that God knows what's best, and he always has my best interest at heart. So I, I, I wanted that. So um, the Word of God has just been, it's been the foundation for everything, and even our lives right now, as we try to acknowledge him in, in, in every way so that he can make straight our path, as Proverbs 3 says. Um, Right before we got married, I think it was, I read a statement that I really didn't understand at the time. And it said, uh, being the right person is just as important as finding the right person. And I didn't understand that then. I do now because um, I, I think it all goes back to obedience, being committed to God first <laughs> and then to each other and obedient to try to do what we know the Word of God says, to be and do what we believe He wants us to be and do. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> Would you give my wife a, a, a hand? <laughs> Thank you, babe. Well, that's what we're talking about today is, uh, this is Valentine's Day, and uh, normally we we talk about uh, love and communication and things of that nature. And I think the last few years on Valentine's Day, I, I, I know last year I talked about um, uh, rethinking love. I took the word phileo and looked at that and uh, showed how it's a lot deeper than most people think. But today I, I just felt the need to, um, to go to Malachi chapter 2. It's not a passage that I would want to preach on. It's not one I enjoy preaching on. But the title of the message is, you know, what about those words at the altar? What about those words? Um, are they man-made promises? Are they our goals, maybe? Are they commitments that we make? And we say, well, try to keep that commitment, but, you know, life happens, and I'll try, just try to do my best. Or... Are we as serious as life and death when it comes to sharing and, and stating those vows? I want you to grab your Bibles and, and, and turn to Malachi chapter 2. In any wedding, you'll hear something like, um, do you promise to love, to cherish, to honor him? and to follow him or her, or to love her, forsaking all others in sickness as well as in health and adversity as well as in prosperity, for better or for worse, and to cleave to him or her as long as you, what's that last line, both shall live. Those are significant pledges. Yet I've wondered over the years, as I've watched, not so much the ones I had the honor to, officiate, but I've watched weddings and at other places, and I've gone to some, and um, I've wondered, as I'm sitting there watching, I'm, I'm thinking, do they really take seriously these vows? It kind of reminds me of what happened to me uh, just a few years ago when I was doing a wedding. Um, we were right here in the, the the groom and the groomsmen were with me right outside in that place right there as we were waiting. And um, the music had started, the mothers were being ushered in, and the best man looked at me, deadpan, and said, 
I don't have the ring. I don't have the ring, he said. I said, you're, uh, you're kidding, right? No, I'm not kidding. Just deadpan. You know, he didn't yell, he didn't get excited. I said, where is the ring? He said, I think it's in my bag in my car out in the parking lot. I looked back out this window right here, or pulled the door open, I should say, and looked out and thought, we got to go. And so I looked at them and I said, we'll fake it. And so uh, <laughs> when I, got, I always get to a place where I say, what, what do you have to show that you will faithfully honor these vows? And they usually say, a ring. And then, and then the best man gives it to me and I give it to him. I usually hold it up and say, this ring, the circle of this ring is an emblem of eternity. It speaks to the issue of how long-lasting the marriage should be, something of that nature. Well, that particular wedding, I said, this ring, (laughs) and went on to say what I was going to say. And then I said, now put this ring on, you know, what you normally say. Well, his bride picked up on what was going on and she started giggling and she kind of but she played she played it right through she didn't move she just played it right through and but you know I I've thought about that event often I'm gonna write a a book one of these days I've often said on funerals and weddings the funny things and the weird things that happen at funerals and weddings because I've had a lot but I've thought about this often and I wonder how many couples don't come without a ring, but they come without a really heart commitment, understanding the seriousness of these vows. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I know they love each other. At least they feel that way. They stand in front of me with ecstatic paralysis. I mean, they're just gooing all over each other. Uh, I understand that. But do they really seriously consider how important this, those vows are? I've seen weddings in which couples laugh through the vow ceremony, that section of it. And I thought, really? That's what has caused me to say, every wedding now that I've done, I will say as we begin to, after a few preliminaries and the introduction to the wedding and what the marriage and whole, all that, I say, now we're about to enter holy ground. And why is it holy? It's holy because this is, you're making a vow not only to your mate, but you're making a vow to God. And that's why it's holy ground. That's why I say to people, I don't want any photographers running around behind me. I say, I, I, I tell the wedding couple, I said, your photographer, he can, when up to the wedding begins, he can hang from the rafter. I don't care what he does. But I said, once the ceremony begins and we begin to go through the vows, they are to be out of sight and a non-distraction because what we say here is so important. Again, I wonder about Marriages today and weddings and how seriously we take those. I, I, couples that I, I do five, I, I require five sessions at least of premarital counseling. And then we, I offer them one six months after uh, the wedding. But in that first session, we talk about divorce. And I ask them, one of the, la- one of the last questions I will ask is, how do you feel about divorce? Now look, <laughs> I'm a pastor I know they know they're sitting in front of a pastor. They're, nobody's going to say, divorce? Oh, I, I think that's a real option. They're not going to say that with me. But then I talk to them about the importance of a life commitment. Well, in Malachi chapter 2, uh, the people have violated the covenant. They've turned their hearts away from God, and they've disobeyed the covenant of their marriage vow. And I want, as we turn to Malachi chapter 2, I want us to pick it up. I want us to read one verse, and that's verse 10. It says, Do we not all have one Father? 
Have not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Now the word covenant is a big word. It's a serious word. Our Lord has numerous covenants throughout the Bible. Uh, Some are conditional covenants, some are non-conditional. When we say conditional, that means that God says, you do this and I'll do this. Then there are others, he says, I'm going to do this regardless. Uh, The Old Testament is made up of 39 books, the New Testament, 26 books. Old Testament, New Testament. What that means, the word testament means old covenant, new covenant. That's a big word. So we come to the question of what does Malachi teach me about marriage? What should it teach me about marriage? Here's the first. As believing couples, and by the way, let me just stop right here for a moment. I know there may be some who are watching, or te- I know there are some who are watching are teenagers, uh, and, and some are young college students and so forth, high schoolers I know are, are watching. And let me just say, don't tune out. Don't, don't tune out. It's easy to say, well, that, 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 I'm nowhere close to that. <laughs> the best thing you can do is allow the word of God to sink into you right now. I am so thankful for that Bible church that had that input into my wife's life. I spoke there a number of years ago, and I said, I owe you a part of my salary each day. Number one, for what I learned here, but number two, for the impact you had in my wife's life. Um, So important, young people, to listen and to grasp what God's word says. But what does Malachi 2 teach me about marriage? Number one, I need to understand God's covenants. Why? Because if God speaks about covenants, I need to understand what he says about covenants and if he, and how he speaks about covenants because if my marriage relationship is a covenant, then how is, how is what God thinks about the other covenants any different than what he thinks about this covenant? And the answer is, there's no difference. There's no difference. The word covenant here appears six times in this small book. In the first half of the chapter two, it is dominated by that very word covenant. Few biblical words are more significant. We watched, or some of you watched, the the Super Bowl last Sunday evening, the NFL, National Football League. The National Football League is a $9 billion a year business. That's a lot of people, that's a lot of jobs, that's a lot of media, that's a lot of logistics linked to a simple pigskin football. That pigskin football is the centerpiece of the game. In fact, there is no game without that football. And without the game, the whole entire system collapses like a house of cards. Now imagine if we had said, uh, if, they, if we'd tuned in for the Super Bowl last Sunday and they'd said, well, look, we forgot to bring the football or the footballs, but we're going to go through the motions anyway. And we're gonna, this is going to really look good. It's going to look real until the footballs get here. How many of you are going to watch that? The same is true in our lives and in our marriage without a covenant, without God's covenant. It's a word that's been neglected for so many years with so many people, but it is the centerpiece of our relationship, not only to God and what he has for us, because remember, we are under the new covenant, the New Testament, that speaks to the issue that Christ has come and died for us, And if we will accept him and receive him, we will have eternal life. That's a covenant. So what about this? Well, let me simplify it. Without getting lost in the weeds of all the covenants in the Bible, a covenant or covenants are tools. If you want a definition for what a covenant is in a simple form, covenants are tools and devices to get people to do what you want them to do. 
for example, you buy a home, you take out a mortgage, you borrow money from the bank, and, you, and the bank says if you, uh, they make you sign all these papers, they're covenants that will say, you know, you'll pay for, you will, uh, each month you'll pay your mortgage, and if you don't pay your mortgage, we're going to take the house away. As simple as that. That's a covenant. Well, God has covenants too. And marriage is a covenant. And when it comes to divine covenants, God draws up, we got to get this, God draws up the contract. In the Old Testament, God established a number of different covenants. The Abrahamic covenant, which was a covenant with Israel. The Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Noahic covenant, and of course the new covenant with Christ. One other that's in this passage is a a covenant with the descendants of Levi. Who was Levi? And what did his descendants do? They were the priestly, they carried on the priestly duties in the temple. They took care of the temple. Now all of that was under the umbrella of the Mosaic covenant that governed their sacrificial system. But look, look a, a covenant is, is not a, just a contract. That's one of the dangers we, we would have just looking at other covenants in, in terms of the earthly covenants. It's a spiritual, spiritually binding relational agreement between God and all of us. It, it, a divine sacred covenant or covenants provide a kind of covering, kind of like a divine um, umbrella. There's protection and there is provision under that umbrella. Through covenants, God works out his kingdom agenda for the benefit of his people and for his own glory. Let me say that one more time. Through covenants, God works out his kingdom agenda for the benefit of his people and for his glory. If you read closely in in our passage and even in other passages, the reason we are married ultimately is to bring glory to God. If you're part of the body of Christ, that's what that's all about. Now, in chapter 2, we have a description laid out of what the priest should be, and uh, and they were not. And uh, and, and really, they were doing the opposite. So I want us to pick it up uh, really in verse 4 before we even get to our text and kind of take a running start at this. Let's pick it up in verse 4. It says, Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you that my covenant may continue with Levi, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life, peace, and I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many back from iniquity. From the lip, uh, lips of a priest, for the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But As for you, he's talking to the priests now. He says, as for you, you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by the instruction. Uh, You have corrupted the covenant. Now watch this. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 9, he says, so I also have made you despised and abased before all the people, just as you are not keeping my ways but are showing partiality in the instruction. Now, what's going on here? Well, these men, these Levi priests, they were allowing the people of Israel to turn from their covenant, their marriage covenant. In fact, not only that, they were marrying other people outside of the race, the Jewish race, and they were told, instructed that you were not to do that Clearly you were not to do that. And so Malachi is bringing God's message, and it's not a pleasant one, as Jim mentioned. Let's read on as we see the magnitude of their sin in verse, beginning of verse 11. It says, Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. 
For Judah has profaned, the, now watch this, profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. As for the man who does this, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob, in other words, from our people, who awakes and answers, or who presents an offering to the Lord. Now, let me tell you what's going on here in this passage as we read on here. I'll just tell you what's happening in verse 13. It says there that the men, were, that the men begin to cry and weep and whine. And why were they doing this? Well, they were, these were the Jewish men who had put their wives away and had gone after a foreign woman who worshipped a foreign god. Now, not only did she worship a foreign god, but she would bring her pagan idol to the temple, which was an abomination of God. And so they're say, now they're saying, oh, you know, they're crying and whining and saying, why, why are we being rejected? Perhaps it was because they were not being instructed correctly. They said, but why are our sacrifices, our offerings being rejected? Now to put that in a modern vernacular today, we would say, why is God not listening to me? Why is he not hearing me? Why is it? Remember Psalm 66, 18? If we regard iniquity in our heart, he, God, will not hear us. There's a corresponding um, passage in First, uh, Second Corinthians that kind of goes with this. Because, again, remember, there, there are several sins here in this, in, in this whole chapter. One was that of marrying the, the, the pagan, but, of course, divorcing their wives as well. But there's a corresponding passage here about the marrying of, of these people who are outside the Jewish race. It has a different application in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Our Lord says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness and what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? And what has a believer in common with an unbeliever. Oh, what agreement has the, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, Paul was, again, using an analogy and showing, again, how we are called, as believers, we are called to marry believers, not unbelievers. Uh, that's vitally important. That's basic. If you're listening to me, you're a college student, a high school student, whatever, clearly the Word of God makes it clear that we are not to marry an unbeliever. Now, let me tell you what people say to me. I've heard over the years, people say, well, look, I, I was a believer and I married my husband or my wife, and she was an unbeliever. And she came to Christ or he came to Christ, so it all worked out fine. <laughs> And I've heard that more than once. And God works, right? God does that. In fact, the Bible says, if I understand it clearly, the unbelieving husband and the unbelieving wife, God kind of puts his, his uh, you know, be, uh, laser beam on them and says, I'm going to work on them. I can show you that in, in Scripture. But for every person who, is, who would say, yeah, that worked out, I can give you three or four people by name, which it didn't work out. I think of one lady who in our church in Riverside loved her husband, stayed with her husband, but every time I would preach this message or something of this nature, she would say, keep preaching it, Byron. I love Johnny. She stayed with Johnny. She said he would come to church with me before we were married, and once I married him, he never came back to church. And it's been heartbreaking sitting in the pew year after year without Johnny. I could tell you other stories. I won't take the time for that. The men, though, here were shocked. But God said, you know, you have dealt treacherously against the wife of your youth, though she was, um, though she was a partner by covenant. Marriage, listen, marriage between a, a man and a woman is a covenant before God, and that's a big deal. So here's number two. I need to recall the witness of, 
of my ceremony. I need to recall the witness of my ceremony. This contract in marriage is not something that's made up at Cobb County Courthouse. Think of it this way. Think of it as God is the one who who does the officiating. In verse 14 and verse 15, I'm not going to read it in the New American Standard, there's some debate as to what is the proper reading in the Hebrew text. And, um, but here's the NIV, and I think the NIV really captures it. It says, you ask why, it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the Lord made them one? Not only is he say, here saying, I'm the one who is officiating, but I'm the one who makes the husband and wife one. I'm, I'm the witness at the wedding. Now hit, let me hit the pause button here and say there will be those, and every time I preach, this is why I don't like preaching this. There will be those who are listening who will say, uh, uh, who, who will feel bummed out because they've gone through a divorce. And that's not my purpose to make them feel, feel you, make you feel guilty or bummed out. After seminary, Debbie and I, uh, I, I went to a church in Newport Beach and became an intern there. That church had a ministry to singles. In fact, they had over 300 singles from 30 years of age and below. They called a full-time pastor for that ministry. But they really didn't have a ministry for those over 30. And there was a lot of big, huge need for that. They asked me if I wanted to take that on. Debbie and I decided, yeah, we'll do it. And while doing that, I learned the heartbreak of those who have been through divorce. Dave and I just loved on them. They just loved us, loved us back. And, and, uh, but boy, I, I, I heard the pain. And, and, and to this day, Debbie keeps in contact with, with some of those ladies. I, I, I want, to, want you to know that if you've gone through it, I, my heart bleeds for you, especially if you've been the one who's been the victim uh, in, this, in this situation. But let me just make a couple of statements, two or three, in fact. In this text, it talks about those who deal treacherously. Who are those? Who, who are those? In this case, it's those who put away their wife, who left them or who became unfaithful with a pagan woman. They saw these nice pagan women. They were, had all the jewelry, and they looked you know, really nice. They, oh, man. Oh. <laughs> Today, those who deal treacherously, in my view, clearly from the text, would be those who leave their wife or husband or who have a a relationship with someone else who's unfaithful. And that's the only basis, by the way, I know of a legitimate divorce. Now, if you're guilty of dealing treacherously, there is forgiveness. One of the things these people, these divorcees would say to me is that, Byron, we're often treated as if we have committed the unpardonable sin. We're treated like that in church. That's not the unpardonable sin. There is forgiveness. Now, having said that, let me just say this. I've had, and and, and my heart has been broken over the years as I've talked to people who, um, and and, and they're telling me they're going to leave their spouse Had one call me in Riverside one time, said, Byron, I'm, I'm leaving my husband, and don't try to stop me. Don't try to talk me out of it. I'm gone. And I've heard, seen that ever since. And here's one of the things I've heard. They will say, God will forgive me. I'm leaving. If I... um. If I have a teenage son and I give him, I I say, okay, we're going to leave town. He's a teenager. He he has his driver's license. Uh, And so I say, son, I'm going to leave. Since you work on Fridays and Saturdays, I'm going to leave our car with you. 
uh, uh, a nice car, and, and uh, you can use it, but you can use it going back and forth to work only. You can't go out with your buddies on the weekend. But what if he does that, and not only does he do that diso- in a disobedience, but he totals the car. Now, am I going to say, well, son, I forgive you. Nope, no problem. I know, you just lapse of memory, perhaps. No, I'm going to say, son, I forgive you, and I love you. But there has to be a consequence here. And here's the consequence. You're going to be grounded for life. (laughs) I'm kidding. No, there has to be a consequence. Remember, David, did God forgive David? Absolutely. But what did he say to David? You got a choice. This is grace. You got a choice of the discipline. That's what we call the doctrine of divine woodshed. God takes us to the woodshed. God in his grace gave David a choice. Neither one was very good. Now look, I'm I'm not trying to heap guilt on top of guilt. And I'm not really talking to those who have gone through divorce. I'm talking to those who might be thinking about it or those who might in the years ahead anticipate or about or think about it. And again, I have been broken hearted. And here's what breaks my heart. I've seen people who are in the church of the Lord and they've taught Sunday school classes and they know the word of God and yet they just emotionally, they say, one person said to me, well, he abandoned me a long time ago, emotionally. Here's the problem in the American church. People go to church today and they talk three minutes about staying married. 42 minutes about love and that kind of stuff. The Bible wants us talking about staying married. What I'm talking about is that your marriage was officiated by God and it was, it was a three-dimension marriage, not a two. You may think it's a two. Uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16, just look at this. It says, to deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters with her words, that leaves the companion, now watch this, leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of God. Forgets the covenant of God. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Freshman. It's a PG movie, I think, back in the 90s. Matthew Broderick uh, is in it, and uh, Marlon Brando came out of retirement to be the godfather. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Matthew Broderick has this budding romance with the daughter of the godfather. And it's kind of humorous, but he begins to realize that that could be hazardous for his health. Because not only is there the godfather, but there's a brother Vinny and some other brothers who say, uh, there's 250 pound guys in black suits that say uh, if you marry my sister you better take care of her you better treat her right you better not treat her wrong you're going to see for me <laughs> I want to tell you um, this covenant has that kind of weight it really does uh, This is it's big and some of you may say, well, man, that sounds like the ball and chain type stuff. And, you know, God wants me to be happy, and, and I wasn't happy, and I'm not happy now, and I want to, you know, blah, 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 blah. And Listen, if, if you're thinking this sounds like a ball and chain, you're on the right path. In Matthew chapter 19, our Lord is having a conversation with some of them. And they're saying, well, what about that divorce thing? And, they, and, and the Greek there is that they kept asking him over and over, how about divorce? It's okay, right? And, it, and Jesus, what did Jesus say? Well, let, let me tell you what he said. Let's just look at what he said. Flip over to Matthew chapter 19 and hang with us. We may be just a few minutes over here. In verse 3 of chapter Matthew 19, where verse 4, Jesus said, 
Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and, and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh? No, so they are no longer two but one flesh. Now watch this. What therefore the pastor has joined together, let no man separate. Is that what it said? What God hath joined together. Who does the officiating? God does. Well, they said, well, what about that, that thing over there in, in Deuteronomy with Moses? And Moses said they could, Moses said they could, you know, get a divorce, you know. What about that? <laughs> and Jesus said, that was because the people at that time were so twisted and messed up. But hear what I have to say. He says, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it, was not, it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And then the disciples again said, with the relationship of the man is with his wife is like this, it's better not to marry. In other words, if this, is, if this thing is about ball and chain and I've got to be, you know, that, that then we just shouldn't get, I shouldn't get married, right? Jesus says, bingo. He says, it's better that you not if you can't stay committed. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 4 says, when you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. In other words, don't come up short. For he takes no delight in, the, in fools. Pay what is your vow. Keep, in other words, keep what, what, keep what your vow, um, pay your vow, or keep your vow. It is better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. Do not let your speech cause you to sin, and do not say in the presence of the messenger of God that it was a mistake. In other words, don't say, oh, well, I was, I was young and stupid, and, and God understood that, and, and, you know, and, and God wants me happy, and, and I'm not happy, and so therefore I'm, I don't love her. Look, Debbie said it. God knows that when he puts you into a permanent relationship with another sinner, for life, there will be pain. Don't say amen, but he knows that. He understands that it will be difficult. But here's the bottom line. The God that, that we are to stand in awe of is the same one that expects us to pay to keep our covenant. You say, what if I've already committed it? Again, there's grace and there's forgiveness. I'm not talking to those who have gone through divorce. I'm talking to those who may be tempted to blow off the last commandment here in, in Malachi 2. You look in verse six, 15 and 16 in Malachi 2. He says, but no one has done so, uh, but no one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking a godly offspring? He says, now he says, take heed then to your spirit. In other words, guard your heart and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. Let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. He says it starts in our hearts. It starts in our hearts. So here's number three. I need to diligently guard my marriage. I need to diligently guard my marriage by guarding my heart. The, the Big Ten Commandments, right? There's one that says, thou shalt not covet, right? Remember that? Part of that, though, says, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's what? Wife. Debbie and I, from time to time, will uh, drop in some of these open houses, and we'll um, look at the houses, and, uh, and we'll say, that's nice, that's fine. But what is it? What if... What if my mortgage was a sacred mortgage? What if my mortgage was something that God says, you've got to be committed to that for life? You've got to live here for life. Would I be looking at other homes? No. 
You know what I do? I have two computer screens on my office. They both have the same picture when you pull up the desktop. It's one of my favorite pictures of, of Debbie. You open my phone, the first thing you're going to see with all the apps on it, you're going to see another picture of Debbie. So why do I do that? One, I like looking at her. Number two, I love her. But number three, my thoughts. I want all my thoughts on her. All my, if, and men fantasize at times. I, if I'm going to fantasize, I want to be sure that it's on her, not somebody else. Invest in your marriage. You see, if, you have, if you, someone said, you've got to stay in that house for life, what am I going to do? I'm going to start investing in it. I'm going to start adding to it. I'm going to start keep, you know, improving it, right? That's the idea. Now, the last thing there, he says, God hates divorce. He hates divorce. So I need to invest in my marriage, and two, I need to, if, if I'm not where I need to be in my marriage, then I need to get close to, to God. My son, one of my sons once said to me when, uh, when we were on a, at a conference, and Boy George came on the radio, and he um, and he, and he heard boy George, and he said, he's about eight to nine years of age. He said, I hate boy George. And I said, well, wait a minute. I said, look, now God, God loves boy George too. And we need to pray for him. But then I thought about that. Where did he get that? He got it from me. He got it from me. He probably heard me say, make some derogatory remark about boy George, and he he, said, he, he, he loves me, he loved me, and he just, he, he, he wanted to have the same hates and likes like he's dead. Huh. If we're not where we need to be in terms of our marriage, we need to get closer to the one who says he hates divorce. Application is, how will you invest in your marriage? How will you invest in your marriage this year?